Good evening. I'd like to call to order the uh, Urban Village Development Commission meeting of tu Tuesday, July 19th, 2016. Uh, first of all, welcome everybody. And um, we're going to start by the uh, looking at the minutes from the last two meetings and giving our approvals, hopefully. Hang on one second. We've got another commission member coming in. Hi. Did everyone get a chance to take a look at the meeting minutes from the last two meetings? Let's go ahead and uh, uh, approve them. Can we approve them together, Lucy? Is that okay? I think you have to do them one individual. Individually, okay. So let's go ahead with the meeting minutes of June 21st, 2016. Um, uh, any questions or comments? No? Okay. Do we have a motion to approve? I move we adopt the meetings. Minute, meeting minutes of 21st June 2016. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Passed unanimously. And for the uh, minutes from June 7th, 2016. Chance to improve. I'm going to let somebody else go. I wasn't at that meeting. Oh, we're not meeting. Okay. Any comments or questions on those minutes? Okay. Everything's good. A motion? A motion to approve. Second. Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? All right. Passed unanimously again. Um, let's go ahead and move on to our first agenda item. We're going to start with Lucy, who's going to talk to us about the quasi-judicial process. Good evening. Um, tonight, you're um, reviewing, and we're asking you to make a decision on a site development permit. That's a, a site plan over three acres uh, in Isqua Highlands, and that makes it a quasi-judicial matter. Um, in a quasi-judicial matter, you um, act like a court, and that means the proceedings have to be fair and appear fair. Uh, the two ways we do that, one is procedural due process, partly around how we notice the meeting, and then the also, there's the focus on the decision maker's uh, relationship with people who would benefit from the decision. Second piece is substantive due process, which has to do with using adopted regulations as the basis for your decision and conditions that are reasonable and related to uh, mitigating problems associated with the permit. So the first and very familiar piece will be to have you read through these questions. And in a moment, I will ask you for your responses. How many people answer no to the questions? How many people answer yes? One portion of it. Okay, which one? That's the uh, owning property in the Highlands. Okay. Same. Likewise. Okay. Um, and then the second piece is um, if the question is whether you've had any ex parte com contacts and um, if there have been, uh, that you reveal them this evening. None for me? No? Okay. Does anyone have any reason to object to the participants <coughs> this evening? All right. Thank you very much. All done. Thank you. Except All right. Carl. Except for Carl. It does go out of drink out of a bottle, apparently. <laughs> We're not going to move on to a uh, presentation from Mike Martin, Associate Planner for Westridge Townhomes I-SDP 16-00001. Good evening. Uh, I'm Mike Martin with the City Associate Planner. And just to recap, um, tonight I will be covering questions and concerns that were raised at the last meeting. Um, and as always, feel free to jump in with questions as I work through this. A reorientation of the project. Um, there you see it in red with the proposed units. This one's located north of Swedish and Discovery Drive and west <coughs> of Grand Ridge Plaza. We're all familiar. Actually. So I know you've all had a chance to read through the briefing response memo and I summarized the questions and concerns that we heard at the previous meeting into six responses tonight. So I'll work through those one by one. You can follow along with the corresponding item number in the packet if you wish. 
the first question and concern, there were questions about the local park, primarily what type of amenities will be included, what is this park going to feel like, who is going to own, operate, and maintain the park. Some of the questions that we had. Uh, the image you see here to the right is an updated image that the applicant prepared in response to the request by the commission. And on the next slide, I'll show you a side-by-side -side so you can see how that evolved. Uh, so here's the, the two parks side-by-side. -side. You can see some of the changes that the applicant has proposed. And Richard Rawlings, if you wish to talk, um, we, we kind of present this jointly. It's, it's a joint response of sorts. So you, you can ask for clarification from the applicant as well. Um, any questions <coughs> about the design? Okay. Oh, let me answer the piece, sorry, about the maintenance responsibility. Uh, this is a private park, so it's privately owned. It will be publicly accessible. There'll be a public access easement that will be a requirement of the construction permits that will be placed on the, on the park. Um, typically, the IHCA owns these, um, though sometimes a sub-HOA can be formed by uh, the Homeowners Association for the specific project. And I see Sarah Hoy here tonight. Um, does the I, do you know if the IHC intends to operate and maintain this, this park? Okay, so it's unclear tonight who actually will be owning and operating, but I think the important piece is that it will be publicly accessible regardless of who owns and operates and maintained. Number two concerns parking. Um, Jeff Walker, you asked for some clarification about the parking counts and getting a little bit more of a refined number. So the applicant's engineer went back and looked at hydrant locations and driveways and other conflicts to try to tighten up that number a little bit. Uh, the box below shows everything in black in that box is what was shown in the staff report and then the numbers shown in red reflect the numbers after a closer examination. So you can see that the total, sp the spaces provided dropped 30 from 441 to 411 and overall, overall they're still over parked in terms of the code minimum requirement by 193 stalls. Mm -hmm. You'll see a note at the bottom, uh, this count does not take into account stalls that will be constructed with this project but aren't per se credited. Uh, mainly those are the stalls on the outer perimeter in blue. Um, most of those stalls will be constructed with the project but they're not reflected in the 441 mm -hmm. overall count. So in reality, there's closer to 500 stalls that will be available when this project builds out. So Mike, real quick, um, yes. thank you for that, first of all. Um, <coughs> you know, I know that those, uh, those elements do have a, um, an impact on the numbers. So as we go forward with, you know, these projects, we've asked for that a couple of times. I think we probably need to be more proactive about including that, you know, that we've taken into account things like mailboxes and that sort of thing if, if we haven't. So that's great, it looks good. I'm, st I'm fine with the numbers. Um, the, the question I have right now are the blue uh, exterior ones you just referenced, the 85 to 90. Um, will those be counted um, to the north with whatever project goes in there? Because I don't want to double count them eventually, right? Yeah, so we're not including them tonight. And Lucy, correct me if I'm wrong, on-street parking is not credited for residential projects in Issaquah Highlands? It can be in Issaquah Highlands. It cannot be in Central Issaquah. Okay. So for future projects, they could credit a portion of a ratio. I think it's half a stall. Again, Lucy, correct me if I'm wrong. I apologize. Quarter um, stall. Quarter. quarter stall. So it is possible that as future projects build out around the perimeter that they could credit some of those. Um, but they're not, they're not credited with tonight's project. 
Okay, and so in for future projects, if I mean we should try and remember this too. But if if you guys can remember, um, you know that we that we we sort of took into consideration, though it's not part of this project. I totally get it. Um, I just don't want you know don't want to double count stuff. Understood. Thanks. And I'll make sure that in the future that we have a more accurate reflection when we bring it forward, so that we don't have to go through this again. Cool. Thanks. Um, and then the second part of number two is bike parking. There was a question about where is the bike parking located? The bike parking should be thoughtfully placed for various users. So the applicant updated this document. The bike parking shown with the little purple stars, but I went ahead and added red circles just to make it really apparent. But I think this shows that the bike parking is pretty amply dispersed around the project so that a user would never have to go very far to find somewhere to hitch their bike. Mike, can I get a clarification? Sure. Um, I, I wasn't quite sure in, in reading this, uh, it says that the current proposal would result in 37 spaces uh, being required for bike parking. And it says uh, in condition 40, most of the bike parking will be located within individual garages, but some bike racks should be provided throughout the site. I don't quite understand how and where the spaces are supposed to be allocated. Sure, so the quantity of bike parking is a function of the amount of vehicular parking that is provided. I believe it's one bike stall for every 12 parking spaces. Um, so that, when you look at the, the parking that they're providing, that nets out to 37 stalls. Uh, the development agreement does allow a project to because this is an entirely residential project, there's an expectation that a lot of folks will store their bikes in their home. Um, so we would, we would factor that into the count. However, in this instance, they've provided all of the parking, all of the bike parking on the exterior, which I think is a good thing. It means that there's a lot of bike parking available. Uh, I think we would have accepted less and allowed them to credit some, not all, but some of the required bike parking, we would assume that those bikes were parked in the homes. Okay, so I, I do think it, there's there's probably adequate um, bike parking for this uh, particular plan. I'm just wondering in the future, um, how do you know that until build out? I mean, you don't know, Carl's a biker and if Carl has a home in there, um, does Carl have to request a a bike rack in his garage and then that's one of the spaces or no there's no kind of physical bike parking thing that we would mm -hmm. require in the unit it's just we assume that there's enough room in the unit for someone to keep their bike okay um i, I think i hear what you're saying i i don't think it's an issue in this case i think if a project came forward where their proposal was for all bike parking to be located indoors I think we would take issue to that and we wouldn't allow that. Um, I don't know that the development agreement spells it out specifically, but I would think that somewhere in the neighborhood of 50% would be the max that we would entertain allowing inside that, you, that wouldn't be publicly accessible. So my question on bike parking is, it looks like there are 22 red circles and purple stars there. So I'm going to assume it's that unit there that holds two bikes, right? Yes. I'm just curious, um, was there any thought or consideration uh, toward, I, I like that it's dispersed the way it is, I think it's great, honestly. I'm just wondering, um, with the park, does it make, since there's no real street parking, or you know, people aren't gonna really drive there, does it make sense to maybe shift some of those closer to the park? I don't know what the behavior is gonna be like, but um, instead of, you know, sort of two, 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 and two, maybe it's you know, four or six closer to the park, and, and maybe fewer where it's all um, concentrated in the middle of the lot. I, I don't know, I just, I don't know what the behavior is, so I just thought I'd throw that out. Have you thought about that? I think that's a good point. I actually did think about that when I was putting this presentation together. I think what they've proposed meets the requirement. I think uh, it makes a lot of sense to locate more bike parking near the highest use, which seems to be the park in this case. I don't recommend changing the condition but what I do think we could do is, uh, I'll be reviewing the permits for this and provide the applicant doesn't have any objections. Um, we could certainly shift some of the bike parking around so that more of it is provided at the park 
that, that's not yeah. a problem. Thanks, and for the record, I think that what you're providing is fantastic, so thank you. Number three concerns trails and public and ped access and safety. Uh, this image was shown at the last meeting, but the red again just shows all of the publicly accessible sidewalks and trails provided within the project. Um, specifically, there was a question by Joy about how the neighborhood trail at this location <coughs> right here will feel as experienced from the public sidewalk along the perimeter. Um, there was concern that that was going to feel kind of gauntlet-like, that it wasn't going to feel welcoming, that a pedestrian wouldn't feel like they could be invited into the space or maybe that they were unaware of it. So I went back and looked at um, a different project. This one's the Brownstones, which I've been using a lot for comparison purposes. But the photo on the upper left, I think is a very close representation of what that's going to look like. The spacing of the buildings is about the same. The required landscape buffer width is the same. Uh, that photo is taken right from the public sidewalk on 10th Avenue East. So I think uh, you can see it, it looks like a sidewalk. It's called a neighborhood trail. I think sometimes that can be confusing, but really what it is is just another sidewalk. And I think that's how it's going to look. Um, Mike, if I could add to yes. that, I actually walked from the other end of that today and noticed the brown trail signs, you know, the brown with white arrows pointing all different directions, which was a change from all the other signage around. So it definitely had a, you know, here's a trail access point oh. feel to it. So, Yeah, one of the construction conditions, if you dig back into the original staff report, there's a condition for pedestrian wayfinding. So that'll further bolster... Um, directional use for, for the site. And then the, the question didn't specifically come up, I don't believe, at the last meeting, but because we are utilizing a feature pedestrian way, which is something that I haven't experienced, I grabbed a couple photos of examples of what that might look like. I don't know that there were specific questions again, but um, there's a couple photos. And then the second part of this is how will pedestrians be protect, protected at the various crossings. You can see all of the vehicle pedestrian potential conflict areas in red. And to deal with this, we do have the two conditions um, that talk about ways to prioritize the pedestrian, the main one being that those spaces, those crossings have to be constructed with a different paving material and different colors. and scoring and whatnot. Additionally, the way that the plant plants are trimmed around there um, and, and other measures as identified in the two conditions, which I'm not going to read, but. Mike, before you move on. Yes. Can I ask a clarifying question? What is the safety lighting that will be on these pedestrian trails? So there's a required lighting plan that will be reviewed with the construction permits, which requires a photometric analysis, not by the city, but by a third-party lighting consultant. So through that process, they evaluate the light levels at the crossings. Um, so that's how that issue is addressed. Uh, the applicant, I don't believe the lighting plan was provided with the SDP documents, though it, they may show the light standards, but the actual light production isn't, hasn't been analyzed yet. Number four concerns project phasing and entitlement. We had a question about this kind of unfinished block at the northeast corner. On the SDP documents, you see block three in there. Um, block three is actually the bigger block <coughs> that isn't specifically that little parcel, so don't let that, that name for that is not block three. Um, but the applicant primarily prepared the response for this one, so I'll defer comment to Richard to talk through project phasing and entitlement. Hi, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Richard Rawlings from uh, Polygon Northwest. 
So we, I think, uh, did have an explanation of this last time. We just wanted to maybe reiterate that that square is attached to a parcel that's labeled Block 3 north of uh, Ellis. So it's, it's, that's one parcel that happens to straddle the right-of-way. And because we have um, reached the existing uh, cap of entitlement or, or density with our other projects that we're working on, um, we need to take this vacant block or that, um, you know, that piece and work through the TDR system that, uh, to bring in TDRs that we had previously purchased and then site plan that, that project and bring it through. Presumably, uh, our intent is to bring it through like this one as, a, as another SDP uh, for site plan and, and, and other review. Um, we'll, we're, start, we're working on that now, our initial stages of kind of getting that, getting that process going, so we're working with staff to outline that and what that timeline might be, and um, so we're ready to, ready to go on that. The, while it may be attached, uh, you know, project-wise to that bulk to the north, the intent is to uh, use the same buildings, the same landscape, all the same street furnishings and so forth to match uh, this current southern project. So even if we change architecture as we go forward uh, in, into the north or, or potentially the product could be completely different, this, our commitment is that this is going to be the same as the rest of what's represented for, the, for this current SDP. Um, is the commission familiar with the term TDR? Okay. So one question on that, Richard, is um, <clears throat> is there any effect to the um, HOA or anything like that if this is built separately, even though it might look exactly the same, sit in the same piece of land essentially, from an ownership or a, a maintenance or anything type of standpoint, is that affected if, you, if it's part of a different uh, Piece of land? The, the normal short answer would be yes, um, but I think that there are ways to post getting through um, kind of the short platting and site development requirements that that potentially can be brought in to this, uh, this community, this neighborhood from a legal point of view so okay. that their membership, their dues, their CCNRs and all those kinds of things are consistent with their neighbors. Right, because I mean, just a, a very simple and probably not likely scenario, but even just from a maintenance standpoint, let's say there's a, an issue with the siding or the roof or something, right. and all of those guys, you know, get the love from the refurbishment, but this one doesn't because it doesn't fit in the same legal category or something. I'd be concerned about stuff like that. No, it's a good point. Um, if if uh, it couldn't be a part of, and I don't know that it can't be, uh, honestly, but... Uh, this community, it is a part of the other community, which would have the maintenance responsibilities and all the similar obligations that that they would if they were a member of this one. Right, but if it was a different product altogether, say single family units, for example. Sure. It could be different, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. But I think there's a construct that, that <clears throat> allows this piece. We just have to kind of work through the nuances of yeah. Of, of, of the uh, you know the state condo act and whatnot you know what's allowable and so we just I, I'm pretty sure it can be a part of this management scheme even if it's a piece of property that's otherwise been through a land use process mm -hmm. yeah uh, certainly not my area of expect expertise but I uh, just want to make sure somebody's thinking about that sure. thank you did you have more to add or okay <clears throat> did so uh, we certainly, uh, you know, thank staff for, uh, you know, drafting the response, um, concur with, with their conclusions and, and recommendations on conditions and so forth. Uh, with respect to the uh, bike parking, uh, I do think that what we've provided is, is, is um, more uh, sort of visitor sort of use, I think, is, is you're going to have kids or whoever visiting and maybe not have access to a private garage. I think most people would keep their bike in there. In, the, in their two-car garage, but um, how it gets used is, you know, fine, but I, I see that as more sort of street furnishing, and this is if you're coming to visit or taking a break. W with respect to the park, we can certainly add, say, one of those more of a rack, like a six-stall, you know, this is a destination area. Um, let, let's go put an obvious place to go, you know, park your bike. That's, uh, that's, that, that's not a problem. Right. Um, and I'm not sure, I think in your packet, uh, the image for the park, I um, appreciate Mike kind of put them side by side, but
but as I was looking at it, I wasn't really sure that it looked that much different from, from what we had. So, so that was my comment and no. Yeah, so I mean, our intent was to kind of um, explain the program in a little more detail. We haven't really engaged in the design process with IHCA and, um, and the city, which is a, it's a joint review. Um, but we wanted to at least to kind of give it maybe some more meat or clarity to the to the program, and so I think we see a significant structure, something that's on the order of you know 24 by 26. That's kind of a structure that we've used before that fits a number of four to six picnic tables, barbecues provided there. Mike, um, can you go site. back to the um, park slide just so um, everyone? So can be looking the reason at I, I sit on the packet, maybe if it's still page two, I have the draft. There were some. I don't know, 12 or so snapshots off to the side, and I don't know if, if, if you saw that. Yeah. Okay. The element. They just didn't come out here. Yeah. So, um, so a significant structure. I think uh, we've done structures that are sort of uh, more sleek and, and made of metals that are painted, uh, everything to, to more uh, timber or, or even, you know, in some situations if the community architecture, you know, would say that it might be a little more logish even. I think this community, uh, we haven't really, um, we just started the process with the IHCA or the ARC to start looking at architecture. We think it's a little more contemporary than the brownstones. Mm -hmm. I mean, quite a bit, frankly, um, mm -hmm. with some similar materials. But we would want that structure, I think, to reflect that or the urban core, you know, some, something that reflects that architecture. So we haven't proposed uh, something specific. The image you see there is kind of a, uh, more of a, a of a metal sleek one. I don't think that's necessarily going to be the. It gives you an idea of the scale, though, that it's it's it, it's got some real size to it, so that a number of people can, you know, can access it and use it. Um, you know, the, again, the large play lawn is something that we heard, <clears throat> you know, from our neighbors to the to the west, and I think there isn't that opportunity currently, you know, planned or, you know, that, that we're aware of or existing on this side of, of Ninth. So I think that's a good thing. There's quite, going to be quite a few people on this side of the road. Um, and it, it's hard to tell, but this this arch, I think you might see that it looks a little beefed up because it is. It's we're, we're envisioning that's 12 feet wide so that on the back side, outside of the arc, you could have comfortable seating tables and so forth where you could relax and watch, but yet there'd still be a generous walk or, you know, I don't know if you really would define it as a promenade, but I guess we see it as having furniture and street lights and whatever to be, I would call it the Brownstone Plaza, but something that was a real um, circulation, you know, identifier that then connected with the uh, feature pedestrian way that, that takes off uh, bisecting the site over to the, be the east. I, I think the, you know, like the southwest corner looks great. I, th I like the yeah. change. And I think there. we want to do some separated potentially. You know, we'll work again through the pl the program. But you notice the plaza. I, I do think the plaza is you know twice the size of the structure. I mean, at least as much outdoors under cover. That's that's hard. Um, so you can uh, use that really flexibly. And then one area might be more structured because there really isn't any structured play. Again, on this side of of the of the highlands. And then maybe some more informal or, or discovery play. So those would be, we see those as probably being different age groups and kind of separated, but yet where the parents kind of want to be and do their thing. So um, I think that's, you know, just wanted to kind of give you a little more meat and kind of what, where, where we're headed as we get into it with the, with the design review. Richard, we had a couple of people questioning, what, what are the vault vents <coughs> on there? So they're the box with the cross hatch or the X yeah. through them on both drawings and it's labeled on the original and vault vents. Yeah, so under the, um, uh, under the, under the uh, park, I'll just step away and kind of show you a line and you can see it in your, in your exhibit. Hey, Rich line. Richard, could you um, use the mouse? That oh. way uh, people at your viewing audience can see as well. So there's a, a grade line that uh, here's a north-south uh, line, east-west, and then north-south again. So from that zigzag to the right of ways is essentially an underground vault, and the park's on top of the vault. It uh, <clears throat> does water quality uh, as well as um, detention functions, and a part of that is it's got to aerate, so it's it, it's got a vent. So it's pretty standard that you know all vaults that you see throughout 
you know, the Northwest, you have this vault uh, vents that are calculated, <coughs> you know, based on, you know, the function of the vault. So there, uh, I would just tell you, I can't remember the size of these, but they're, they're probably on the order of, say, six feet by 12 feet. They can be a number of different things, and so we were trying to find a way to, number one, don't have them out in the middle of the lawn, you know, where you're trying to run and jump and, you know, fall. Uh, try to get those in a place where they, they're not obstructive and they don't uh, really uh, hurt the function of the park. And then um, they could be raised. We can artificially raise those on uh, essentially a concrete wall. It does need to have a vent, but uh, in other communities we've attached seating and different things to them, or they could, uh, in this uh, scenario, we may raise them but fill up to those so, so the whole bed is raised. You know, I think we've got to go through the design. But that's what those are. They're a, they're a, a graded vent uh, for the uh, functioning of the of the stormwater vault. Uh, is the lawn flat, or is there some some uh, slope to it? Well, there would be slope. It, it needs to drain, and um, <clears throat> a significant slope, or or one that's well, we see it as you know three percent, or you know something that promotes enough drainage so it doesn't uh, end up soggy. These kinds of areas that are over the vaults, we would put uh, a lot of, uh, there's a free draining material layer on top of the vault. You don't, we don't want the weight of that water sitting on the vault. Uh, so there's a combination of uh, granular rock material as well as pipes to take that water away. So it's actually gonna be, I wouldn't call it like some of your more sophisticated sports fields, but certainly more draining than uh, you know, throwing the topsoil out there and, 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 and you know, laying sod down. But there are specific requirements, I think, in code, and then there's just good practice, you know, somewhere around three, maybe a maximum of four percent, which is, you know, fairly, uh, fairly level, but yet draining, so that it's so that it's open for multiple uses. It's yeah. so the users won't necessarily feel that it's a slope; they're not going to be sledding down Correct. it. Correct. But yeah. it won't it, be a sledding hill. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's for sure. I want to make sure I understood yeah. it. Thanks. And so, in order to do that, as we go through the design. Um, you know, the right-of-ways on the edges may not be as flat as we want the park, and so there could be uh, some small landscape walls or something to, you know, as the sidewalk uh, would taper at a, at a steeper grade than the park, then we may have to support the park. But that's the intent is to have it be, uh, yeah. Great. Flat. Any questions? I think we have a couple more responses, right, Mike? Um, I'll take this opportunity to let uh, people know that we a after this, and if, if uh, Mr. Rawlings has more to say, we'll have some uh, public comment opportunity. So if you're interested in speaking, go ahead and put your name on the list, and we'll, uh, we'll get to you shortly. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Uh, response number five pertains to building design, and I think at least two or three commissioners um, raised concern over one of the conditions that talks about treating the ends of virtually all the buildings as they have a fairly prominent um, presence on the adjacent pedestrian circulation network. Uh, when I created the original condition and sketch, I did not include uh, two units, and the commission asked that those units be included in the condition. So those two are located in green. Um, the proposal now in the revised condition 42, which I'll read in a moment, uh, does include those. So the recommendation by staff is to revise condition 42 um, so that it reads, the end units of any buildings will face, which face streets or trails, shall be designed with features that provide differentiation, differentiation such as varied types of colors, materials, and architectural embellishments, such as windows, shutters, porches, private courtyards, patios, etc. This condition applies to the end units, both ends of buildings one through four, and the street or trail facing units for all remaining buildings five through 22. I recognize this particular drawing doesn't have the building numbers labeled, but uh, buildings one through four are these four right here. So I, I believe that condition revision addresses the concern that was raised. Uh, just minor thing, Mike, yeah. on that. Um, 
this is a Jeff thing, I'll give him credit normally, the which cut, face the, a no. street or trail, I think in the first sentence, instead of face a streets or trails. It fits with the, no. the last sentence as well. I Every just, time you gotta get me on something. <laughs> yeah, that's. Police strike again. Yeah, I actually see I missed a comma in there as well, so. Um, functionally and intently, yeah. the condition is sound, but we can uh, make those, air, those changes. Thanks. And the final response, um, more edits. So there was a question raised about the wording of condition 41. So I went ahead and reworked that uh, as follows. Revised condition 41 to accommodate architectural features consistent with the goals and guidelines where there are leftover landscape areas between the ends of the buildings and the adjacent sidewalk or trail. Appropriate building elements such as additional rooms, covered terraces, or similar covered space shall be employed so that the building extends toward and engages with the trail or sidewalk. And then finally, um, I just noticed in condition 53, it referenced a neighborhood walk instead of a neighborhood trail. Those are two different standards. In this project, we have neighborhood trails, so I propose that we revise condition 53 to read neighborhood trails shall be a minimum of six feet in width and shall be constructed with concrete. That concludes my presentation. Uh, happy to answer questions. Uh, we'll have an opportunity for public comment and we can also take questions during commission discussion. Thank you, Mike. Any comments for Mike before we ask Mr. Rawlings if he wants to say anything else? No? Richard, anything else to add? No? Well, if you wanna, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fine unless you had a, a question. For Any the, questions for Richard? No, okay. thanks for addressing uh, all of those concerns, both the city and applicant, we appreciate that. I, I'm satisfied that, uh, that my questions got answered. I hope you guys are too, yes? Yeah. Okay, uh, so at this time I'd like to go ahead and open up uh, the public comment portion of the meeting. Is there anybody that wishes to speak tonight? <clears throat> I'll ask one more time, anybody wish to speak tonight? Seeing none, I'm going to go ahead and close the audience uh, comment portion, public comment portion of the meeting. Okay, so at this time, it says other business and announcement, but I'm assuming it needs to move toward a decision before we get into other business, right? Yes. Okay, so at this time, if there, uh, if the commission would like to discuss this, we should we should do so because we're going to be going into a, a decision in a few moments, so I'd like to open this up to the commission to uh, bring up anything that they might want to discuss. Is there anybody that would like to say anything, ask uh, questions? Just so we know that the microphones are working, I would, <laughs> I appreciate the staff and the applicant for the work that they did. I mean, this is as clear and as straightforward and we got things addressed. I think the only comment I would even make is I don't think we were looking for changes to the park, it's just clarification what the design elements were, which were addressed perfectly so this is this is very good thank you I would like to mention that we saw an update on that park that included um, a chess play area mm -hmm. and we had made a comment I think a few of us last time that we felt that while that it, it, from a design standpoint look can look nice in the community it can also be very limiting and uh, that maybe that space might be more appropriately used in something that can have more people integrating in the space okay thank you anybody else I guess I was gonna make a comment. Um, you know, we talk about parking on all of these sites, uh, particularly around the hospital. And, uh, you know, the thought is that there may be people from the hospital that are using the adjacent neighborhoods for parking. And uh, over the last three weeks, uh, I had to be up there at the hospital um, three days a week, and not once could I not find any kind of parking. So I just kinda of wanted to make that comment. And this was prior to the new 300 spot lot opening. Um, I think it becomes less and less of an issue, uh, you know, Swedish uh, people taking up spots as we go north. Right, yeah. good to know. All right, are there any other comments or questions for staff or applicant? Okay, and I have none, sorry. So I think at this time I'd like to go ahead and call uh, for the question or see if there's somebody who would like to make a motion, which 
is in front of us. Is there anybody that would like to take a look at this and make a motion? I already have one. Do you want to go for it? I'm not ready to talk. I'll start. <coughs> okay, I'll do it then. Unless you want to. Okay. okay. Uh, draft motion for approval West Ridge Townhomes 1. Is it 1 or? Yeah, it's 1, right? Uh, townhomes 1 Site Development Permit. I move that the Urban Village Development Commission approve the Westridge Townhomes 1 Site Development Permit, file number STP 16-00001, as described in the staff report dated June 14, 2016, its attachments A through E, the briefing response memo dated July 13, 2016, and subject to the terms, conditions, and rationale contained in the staff report, and as amended this evening, no amendments. Also, I move that the Urban Village Development Commission direct the Development Services Department to prepare findings of fact and conclusions for review and approval by the Urban Village, Village Development Commission chairperson, affirming the Urban Village Development Commission's decisions to, decision to approve the site development permit application for Issaquah Highlands, Westridge Townhomes 1, file number STP 16-00001, subject to the conditions listed in the staff report, briefing response memo, and as amended this evening. Thank you, Jim. I, I would like to uh, say that there were a couple of quick amendments, but that was based mostly on um, just the, the cleanup that you had, Mike had, so I just want to make sure that that's clarified. But no new amendments or conditions have been added tonight. So we have a motion. So, Jeff, just to clarify, you're, you're referring to, like, the typos? Exactly. Okay. Um, so we have a motion. Do we have a second? A second. All right. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and ask for a vote. So all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay. So it has passed unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. At this time, we'll go ahead and move on to other business and announcements. Lucy, do you have anything tonight? No. Um, we, uh, I think that at some point, uh, we will be bringing forward the, um, major modification that Richard referred to for the transfer of development rights. Um, we're anticipating that that would come to the commission on the way to the council. Um, I'm, uh, we've been working with uh, the applicant on that, but I don't think we have a schedule laid out. Um, and off the top of my head, I'm not thinking of any other permits that are headed your way. Okay. So in that case, we would not have a meeting on the 2nd of August, most likely? Is the right. I. Yeah, it's scheduled for August 2nd. I think that's the, um, just on our regular, yeah. right, calendar as opposed to um, the, uh, actual having content. So I will be out of town that day, just for the record, if if this, if this it does come about. And As will I. As will I. As rightly you should. <laughs> Maybe um, not a good night. We, um, I think that we're anticipating that it would probably be September um, before we were back to, to you guys. Okay. Great. Is there anything else from the commission you'd like to bring up? <laughs> no? All right, well, this may be a record for us. Congratulations. At this time, uh, looks like 7.44, we're going to adjourn the meeting. Thank you very much.